and Mencius' view of cultivation and how his view of cultivation is really um, a great example of the dynamic nature of Confucianism, how much Confucianism can change and adapt to circumstances and evolve. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mencius, a little bit about Mencius' view of cultivation and all of this to show us something about the Confucian tradition. Let's start with Confucius. Um, some of you know this, but uh, let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Confucius' name in Chinese is Pongsa. Um, there are his dates. He was born in the state of Lu. Um, Confucius, during his lifetime, attempted to centralize the government in Lu, and he didn't succeed at that. He also tried to become a top advisor to a king, thinking if his state of Lu wasn't going to follow uh, the way that he thought they should follow, he would go find another kingdom. Um, and he actually failed at that too. Of course, ultimately he wasn't a failure. As a teacher, he was an incredible success. Um, but he didn't really succeed at the two things that he uh, attempted. I want to give us a little bit of political uh, context so we can see exactly why Confucius was trying to do what he was doing and what was involved. So Confucius lives during the Zhou dynasty. It's a very long-lived dynasty, over 800 years. Um, and it's traditionally split up into the Western Zhou and the Eastern Zhou. During the Western Zhou, uh, the Zhou dynasty is extremely strong. And it covers quite a bit of territory. And the way it covers that territory is through a system of vassalage, right? Successful generals. Um, relatives to the, the king are given little bits of land all over the place. All right. Eventually, the Western Zhou has a lot of trouble. Um, they're attacked and they have to move to the east. They move their capital. Uh, and what happens in, during the Eastern Zhou is all of these little vassals start getting more and more power. And they become little kingdoms on their own. Um, and there are many, many, many of them. The Eastern Zhou period is often divided into the spring and autumn period. It gets its name after um, a, a collection of texts that Confucius himself is supposed to have um, edited about the state of Lu. And then the Warring States period. Confucius is living just at the end of the spring and autumn period. And what characterizes that period is that Zhou still holds nominal power. People are still, you know, we're in the Zhou dynasty. Joe is still a player, but real power tends to reside with the Ba, with uh, certain hegemons, and it changes from state to state. But they're still wielding their power, if you will, in the name of Joe. Eventually, that system also collapses, and we have what's called the Warring States period. All of these little tiny states start gobbling each other up, and so we're left with just seven rather large states. And they are all battling one another and trying to take each other over. And that eventually happens in 221 with the Emperor Qin's unifying of uh, the Chinese Empire. So all of this to say that this is the period that Confucius is in. And he's at the very, very end of this period. But Mengzi lives 100 years later and is actually in the Warring States period. Okay? So Mengzi has, he's dealing with a different world, a different political, historical uh, situation. Um, so often when I ask students when I'm teaching Confucianism, and I ask them what they think of Confucius on the first day before we've actually read any of the Analects or, or anything about Confucius, often what they'll say is that Confucius is all about tradition and is all about ritual. And of course, as far as that goes, that's true. Um, Confucius lives at the end of the spring and autumn period, and he's looking back to the Western Zhou as an ideal time. Okay? Um, the master said, following the proper way, I do not forge new paths. With confidence, I cherish the ancient. Okay? So Confucius tells us that he's not an innovator. He is not presenting something brand new. Instead, he's looking back to a tradition, something that was working in the past and can work again. Um, now, given Confucius' claim to be a transmitter and not an innovator, and the preeminent importance of the Zhou dynasty as an ideal model, Confucianism may seem like a static, backward-looking philosophy. And that's often how students see Confucianism before they've actually
actually read anything um, about Confucius. And this view, I'm going to say, can be exacerbated for English speakers you know, that we're always looking back and looking back to this founder because of the very name Confucianism. I mean, that's, you know, based upon Confucius's name, the people who follow Confucius. Whereas, actually, what this school of thought is called among the Chinese is the Ruja, the family of scholars, if you will. So Confucius's name isn't even there. Okay, so there's this tendency to look back and to think that it's always about this, um, this um, reverence towards the past. And, and it is in part, but we can, we can push that a little too far. So tradition, how does um, Confucius really feel about tradition? So here's another quotation from the Analects. The master said, the use of a hem cap is prescribed in the observance of ritual propriety. Nowadays, that a silk cap is used instead is a matter of frugality. I would follow accepted practice on this. A subject kowtowing on entering a hall is prescribed in the observance of ritual propriety. Nowadays, that one kowtows only after ascending the hall is a matter of hubris. Although it goes contrary to accepted practice, I still kowtow on entering a hall. And so, so Confucius really isn't calling for, you know, let's just keep all the traditions as they were. There is room for change within um, Confucius's worldview. Um, he'll gladly change to a hemp cap. Why? It saves money, so why not do that? Um, I'm sorry, he'll change to a silk cap. That's what saves money. He'll change, you know, the material that the cap is made out of because it saves money, but he's not going to change a ritual just because of hubris. Okay? So there is room for change in Confucianism. Now, Mencius is often called the second sage of Confucianism. Um, he lives about 100 years after Confucius. Uh, he's important for several reasons. One reason, this is a little bit of a digression, but I do want to mention it, is his mother. There's a saying in Chinese, Mencius' mother three moves. Uh, Meng Mu San Qian. Uh, Mencius' mother three moves. Mencius' father died very early in his life. And uh, he and his mother, his mother was raising him, a single parent, and they're living next to a graveyard. And so the story goes that Mencius starts imitating the professional mourners. He starts wailing. And the mother is like, oh, I don't want my son growing up to be a professional mourner. So she moves. She moves next to a market. But the problem is then Mencius starts imitating the merchants. And his mother thinks, I really don't want Mencius to become a business major. Um, and perhaps I shouldn't put it that way, given where I'm giving this talk. But, okay. um, I don't want him to become a merchant, right? So she moves a third time and moves next to a school. And Mencius starts imitating scholars. Okay. So mother, really important, important woman in the Confucian tradition and the Chinese tradition. Also, there's another little story. Uh, Mencius shows up midday one day at home, and his mother says, what are you doing? You're supposed to be in school. And he said, well, I just felt like quitting. And his mother had been at the loom. She was uh, weaving something, so she took out a pair of scissors and cut the garment in half. And Mencius says, what are you doing? And she said, I just feel like quitting. And so that really had an impression on him. Okay, I can't quit halfway through things. I really have to follow things through if I want to achieve anything. So really, really important influence. He, according to tradition, or at least some tradition, he's supposed to be a student of Zizi, who is the grandson of Confucius. This probably isn't really the case because the two men did not live at the same time. So, but um, it does show how important it was to the tradition to show that there's this connection between Mencius and Confucius. Um, Mencius actually attained high office as high minister of Qi, um, much higher office than Confucius was ever able to do. Although he eventually left that too because the king wasn't listening to him. Um, and the collection of his dialogues with his students and various kings becomes one of the four books, which is the basis for the imperial examination system that is in place for almost 600 years, from about 1313 CE to 1905, all the way into the 20th century. So incredibly important figure for the Confucian uh, tradition and for Chinese culture in general. Now, as I said, lives 100 years after Confucius in a very, very different time. This is the Warring States period. And it's not just the Warring States period, but there are a lot of other schools of what we would call schools of philosophy at this time. 
right? There are a lot of other contending viewpoints on how the state should be ordered and how we should live and what we should do, all right? Um, not all of these are actually around by the time we get to Mengsa. This is just all from the warring states period. But for, for Mencius, Moism and Yangism are two schools of thought that are really, really important um, because we can see the way Mencius develops the Confucian tradition is, in some sense, a response to these two schools and their criticisms of Confucianism. So first, Moza and Moism. Um, Moza talked about impartial caring. Caring for everyone equally. The people close to you, the people far away, the people related to you, people not related to you. Okay? This is contra Confucianism that really stressed the family and friends, um, people that are in your immediate circle, you and yours. Um, Moza also criticized Confucian, Confucius and um, the Ruja. I'll, I'm just going to call it Confucianism, but you know. Uh, we know that that's the Ruja, right? He, he also uh, criticized them for their extravagance in rituals and in music. All this money being put towards musical instruments and towards these rituals. And, and all of this money being spent on funerals. And people, um, according to Confucian tradition, were required to, um, to mourn for three years for their parents. So a great reduction in productivity. How can you impartially care for all, and how can you provide for everyone if all of this money is going into just these, these empty rituals? Okay, that's the, that's the criticism Moza is making. So according to Moza, Confucianism is too restrictive in its emphasis on partial caring for family and friends. Okay, bear your parents and then just walk away. Um, you shouldn't care for them more than you care for anyone. So, is this a fair criticism? Well, Confucius on partial caring. So, the governor of Xi, in conversation with Confucius, said, in our village, there is someone called true person. When his father took a sheep on the sly, he reported him to the authorities. Confucius replied, those who are true in my village conduct themselves differently. A father covers for his son, a son covers for his father. And being true lies in this. Okay, so the governor of Xi is, seems to be really praising um, this fellow called a true person, or some have translated this as like goody-goody, right? Goody two-shoes. Um, uh, is really praising this person, right? Because there's impartial care. Hey, if I catch a thief, whether it be someone related to me or a complete stranger, I turn him in. That's what you do. It's just impartial. It shows no partiality for fam family members. Well, Confucius is here saying that, no, you should be partial. Sons should cover up for their father. Um, now, this is a really interesting passage, actually, to think about all on its own. And I will just mention, I'll give a, a, a little mini defense of, you know, this, this might seem horrible to some people. Like, you, you know, should you really, no matter what your father does, cover up for him? Well, the reason I've got the, the Chinese wrong here, um, that word seems to mean stealing, but stealing when you're in dire straits. So one way to take this passage is that the father may be stealing the sheep to cover for the son. The son never returns the favor. So this isn't just, you know, your father's a, a rotten thief and you just protect him. It's like, no, the father is doing what he can for the family and trying to get food. And the son instead is just ignoring that and not, um, not paying attention. Oops, don't want to jump. Not paying attention to this relationship that he should have with his father. Um, but still, partial caring, yes, definitely that is part of the so that's Moza and Moza's um, criticism on Confucius, and at least one passage why he might be making that kind of criticism. There's also this fellow, fellow named Yangju. Now we know a lot less about Yangju, and actually there's some doubt as to whether or not he really had a school of thought and how we should think about that. But for our purposes, you know, uh, Mencius mentions him a lot and definitely sees his position as being different than Yangju's. So Yangju talks about human nature human nature. And what he says about human nature is that according to human nature, we all want to preserve ourselves. That's what's natural. And so according to Yang Ju, the other regarding nature of Confucianism, this call to regard others, right, your family, um, but also your friends, your ruler, 
requires sacrifice that goes against human nature and so is artificial. There's a famous saying, and it's probably not really being fair to Yongju at all, but um, there's a saying that um, Yongju would not cut one hair off of his body if it would, would save the world, okay? And again, is that really his position? Probably not, but he's stressing human nature, and there's something about Confucianism that is artificial, because it is forcing us to care for others when really by nature we only care for ourselves. So Confucius on self-sacrifice. The master said, for the resolute scholar apprentice and the authoritative person, while they would not compromise their humaneness to save their lives, they might well give up their lives in order to achieve humaneness. So in order to achieve this connection with others, it might very well be possible that you have to give up your life. And certainly that you have to sacrifice certain comforts that you have. You can't be the egoist that Yangtze seems to have. Think you need to do. So these two criticisms are made of the Confucian tradition. And this is what Mencius has to say about Mozza and Yangju. The doctrines of Yangju and Mozza fill the world. If the doctrine does not lean towards Yangju, then it leans towards Mozza. Yangju is self-preservation. This is not to have a ruler. Mozza is impartial caring. This is not to have a father. To not have a father and not have a ruler is to be an animal. So both of these positions uh, reduce humans somehow to animals. In what way? <clears throat> so this is Mencius's response. At the heart of his response to these criticisms is perhaps his best known teaching that human nature is good. Though Mencius did not mean by this that all humans are good, so we want to get really straight on exactly what he might have meant by Renchin. As for what humans are inherently, they can become good. This is what I mean by calling their nature good. So he's not saying that whatever humans do, they do for the good. He's not saying that we're all born good and ready to go. But we all have this tendency to be good. We all have these potentialities towards good behavior. And I want to talk a little bit more about human nature so we can uh, not make the mistake and attribute to much to something that he's not saying. So this word, um, xing, is related to sheng. Um, and Sheng can mean generation, growth, life, process of life, to be born, to grow. Okay, so a better translation or a more fuller understanding of what Sheng is might be something like a proper course of development of a thing during its process of life. So this is not a static human nature. It is not some essential feature of human beings that is already there in full. Nor is it necessarily a goal, right, that we want to achieve. Instead, human nature is just this potentiality. And it can go in a variety of ways depending on what we do and how we cultivate ourselves. Okay. So notice that, you know, Young Jews' criticism of Confucianism was that it violates human nature. What Mencius is doing is he's taking up that idea. Okay, let's talk in terms of human nature then. Turns out that Confucianism doesn't violate human nature, according to Mencius. Now, I want to talk about what Confucius has said about human nature just to show how much of a development and an evolution of Confucianism this is. And again, not necessarily a, a natural evolution, but a decision that Mencius makes. He, he changes what the Confucians are actually saying at this time. So Zedong said, one does not get to hear the master, that is Confucius, expounding upon the subjects of human nature or the way of heaven. So we have one of Confucius' students saying that this is just something Confucius never talks about. And actually he does mention it, right? Because Confucius said, by nature, Xing, people are similar. They diverge as a result of practice. And that's the only mention of Xing in the Analects. Right? And the only thing that comes from Confucius himself is just that by nature people are similar. Now that is open. People can be similarly neutral, they can be similarly good, similarly bad, right? It's Mencius who interprets this. Confucius must have meant that people are good, or at least that's what Mencius is going to go with. So Mencius's response to young Jew. Young uh, Jew is the one, the egoist, who is saying that um, Confucianism is artificial. 
it's trying to get us to 